Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Big Data Meets uh, Orchestrator. So, uh, my name is uh, Bart Smith. I've been working on DCUS for uh, two uh, startups, both from an enterprise company. So, one was a startup which was really uh, using the, what's really going all the way. So, they went for the uh, public cloud. They were using, they were using uh, DCUS on uh, Azure. And uh, the other one, uh, they uh, go halfway, so they are going to use cloud native technologies, but then on their own on-premise hardware. So uh, let me just go first about, talk about a little bit about, uh, uh, oh yes, uh, something more about myself. I like to work, design things, then build them, and then support them, uh, and work with uh, developers and help them on onboarding and help them write JSONs, etc. work with big, their big data applications. So hardware in the traditional big data environment, this is just from some slides I got from uh, some HP uh, website or, or uh, PDF. There you see a very big storage rack with lots of hardware in it. Uh, I need my glasses to, to read it, but well, but you understand, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of storage there, a lot of big drives, and, uh, uh, and that is then maintained by companies like uh, Hadoop or, or no, Hortonworks, I mean Hortonworks, Horton uh, and I don't know how, how much you would pay for this, but uh, you can guess it's only used for this big data application. And then, going back to Taco's uh, talk, when you would use, oh, no, one more thing, this is uh, Elastic, same thing. You have a lot of different uh, servers running all their own uh, part of the story of Elastic. By the way, this is a picture I took at, at their conference, so I couldn't find it anywhere else but on my own phone, so I just used this. So lots of storage used only for the big data application, and lots of hardware. Whereas if we go to microservices, we have a completely opposite. The microservice world, applications are stateless. Uh, you can replace them easily because they have no state. If one fails, you just replace it. If you have a new version, you just uh, do a green-blue uh, deployment. So just add a new version and then get rid of the previous version. Uh, if you need more performance, you just scale out, not scale up. So you don't buy hard, faster hardware, but you buy, uh, you, you add a few more instances. So it's a completely opposite way of working, using an orchestrator, DCOS, uh, Kubernetes, whatever you wish, and there is no storage. So that was the model I was using at my first startup. They were using Azure, where the uh, Kubernetes, or the DCOS platform was managed by us, and the storage that we left to the Microsoft guys. So that what we pay for. So they maintained our SQL servers, our uh, storage, we had some Ling Ring uh, VMs for, for site services. So all the storage was done by Microsoft. So there, we didn't have to care of the storage. And now, we want to merge those two. We want to merge the, the uh, storage of the big data together with the microservices. But before we do that, just let's go back, let's go to what is DevOps. Probably all of you know, are aware of these uh, these items, just go through them quickly. Uh, the idea is a pizza team. So you have your business directly with your developers. No management layers in between. Uh, you work directly with your customer. You make something, you, you show it to your customer, and then you probably will deploy it or you fix it, and then you go to the next version. The weekly scrum uh, uh, rhythm. Uh, you use your testing, CI, CD, well, I don't have to tell most of you, and, but very important is you have immutable infrastructure. So if a server crashes or something goes down, you just replace it or you just leave it lingering. I think that one of the, major, the big manufacturers like Facebook, they don't even reinstall a server. You just leave it there and then after three years they will throw it away, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole server. A major difference between the old way of thinking, where you have VMware, where you have the uh, big storage vendors like uh, Hitachi Data Services, NetApp, etc. There, 
you focus all your energy in getting high uptime on your infrastructure. So you pay big bucks to those to the VMwares, to the uh, to the Hitachis to get 100% uptime. Whereas in the new world, there you put all your efforts in getting high uptime of your on layer seven. So and, and we will see the same thing happening here. So we will start using storage or databases that replicate on themselves, on themselves, and not use VMware replication or high HI uh, tooling and uh, an expensive storage. No, we will use. We go back to the, back to the basics. Use simple storage. Well, the last things I think are most of you will know what 12 vector apps are, but stateless apps. That's sort of the sort of the, the thing. Um, one small thing about, about DCUS, uh, Taco mentioned mo most of it, but I just want to go through it a little bit more in more detail, is that we, what we see here is we have on the, on the, on the bottom, we have uh, our physical nodes. So that's a computer, yes? And that computer runs multiple applications, like you do on your laptop. On your desktop computer, you run applications simultaneously. So you have your text editor, you have your browser, and they all run on the same physical computer, separated by some mechanism of separation. So if one crashes, it doesn't take down the whole computer. But who schedules that? That's scheduled by the operating system, by the Mac OS, by Linux, by Windows. On DCOS, or on Mesosphere, we have multiple uh, computers. And the Mesosphere is a layer there you see the Mesosphere layer, that schedules those applications on one or multiple of those servers running in the Mesosphere cluster. So what makes Mesos or DCOS so special is that they don't have one, but they have two schedulers. So there you see the, the Marathon scheduler, and the Marathon scheduler asks the Mesos scheduler, do you have some resource for me? Do you have some disk space? Do you have some ports for me? Do you have some memory, some CPU for me, and then the Mesos scheduler will say, okay, yes, I have that. Okay, please, now schedule this application for me on one of these nodes. I don't care where, just schedule it for me. And if you need more, then schedule it somewhere else. So, and that's why you see Kubernetes coming back, because Kubernetes, as Taco mentioned, is one of the other schedulers, it's just like Marathon or, and there we go, or a big data application. So when Taco, you mentioned, I think you mentioned Kafka, no, what, what application did you mention? What DCOS does is they create a framework, and that framework, that's another, yet another scheduler. And that scheduler is sort of a man in the middle between the Mesos scheduler, that can schedule anything on one of those nodes in the frame, in the, in the cluster, and it has, on the other side, it has knowledge about Kafka in this case. So it knows how to start a Kafka cluster. It knows how to repair a Kafka cluster. And that's, it's sitting in between. It knows both of the framework and it knows about the, uh, about the big data application. Does that make sense to you? Anyone knows the word they use, not, they don't use framework, but in Kubernetes they have another word for this? Anyone knows the word? They came up with it. They could have called it framework, but they said, no, we use our own word. Anyone familiar with Kubernetes? So what's the, what's the framework that the, the man in the middle that, well, I'm not going to use the word because then I tell what the word is, that da-da-da, both the application and on top of the scheduler, on top of the computers. Who does that? That's an operator, yes? So Kubernetes, they call it operators. Am I there with you? An operator manages the, the database servers, and if the server goes down, it will take it back up, it will replicate it back. It knows about the application. But you still need to do some manual work at once, once in a while, but I'm not gonna go into that. But it goes from being very difficult, you need to be an expert, to being, okay, this is done almost automatically for me. I don't need to know much about it, I just need to fill in a few parameters and that's it. 
So in DCOS is a framework, Kubernetes now they call it uh, an operator. So now we have these operators. So on the top we see our microservices. The traditional microservice I was running at the first startup. And at the bottom, we have our databases. But the difference between those databases and the traditional databases, they're not replicated by or stored on big, big storage uh, applications, Itachi, NetApps. No, they're stored on simple disks and they, and they replicate on layer seven. So they do their own replication. And that makes them cheap, unless you need to know all about them. <laughs> Let's take care of the operators or the frameworks, yes? So that was a little bit of an introduction to how frameworks work, how they work on the, on the, uh, on the platform. Yeah, I need to, do I need to stand in the light or out the light? Out the light, okay, I'm sorry. She will cut it out, she's a professional. <laughs> Okay, so that was sort of the introduction to how frameworks work, how operators work, how that works together with, with DC, on DCOS or on Kubernetes for that matter, yes? So now this is sort of a, a, a depiction of what we have currently at my second customer. That's an HP Synergy blade, a box, and that box has blades. They have one local disk, that's an SSD, where the operating system is running on, and they have uh, and, 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 and one part of the, of, the, of the blade cabinet, they have lots of storage. And that storage can be added then di dynamically uh, to the blades. But for now, at, in the current environment which we, uh, which we use, we have two drives, two ter terabyte drives, and one 800 gigabyte SSD. They're connected uh, through some uh, SAS bus directly to each of the nodes. So that's the setup we have. It has, we have lots of CPUs, lots of uh, memory, of course. This enterprise thinking. So this is local storage, yes? But what you see is if I add a node, I add more storage. That's not the traditional way of thinking. There you have a computer, VMs, and you have your storage. Hitachi, NetApps, whatever. Yes, IBM. Now, if you add more, more nodes, you add more storage. Or even in the Synergy case, you, you can add more storage just by dynamically adding it. You can just go into the physical, uh, into the interface of the HP Synergy, and remotely you can add a few more drives to, the, to a node. So for now we start with this. Maybe uh, in a couple of months we add two more disks to every node. And then we expanded the storage from four to, to eight terabytes uh, of uh, ATDs. So that's what we call hyperconverged storage. It scales automatically with the number of nodes. And on that storage, we are, and Taco already introduced it, we have two kinds of storage. I call one of them, I call meso storage, for better or worse, be best word I could find. And the other one is portworks. So, Portworx. So uh, here you see Portworx is it's it's a, a storage entity running on all nodes, and it can connect in the backend to the cloud if you run in a public cloud. ESB that's from Amazon. It can it can run to your legacy SAN if you want to, and it can connect to local SSDs and ACD. And that's what we're using. So we're not doing anything else. We just use those local SSDs and ACDs. But if you have legacy things running uh, around or you still want to go to the public cloud, that's fine, yes? So a little bit about the architecture. What you see here is that the client makes writes to a local volume. And that volume then is replicated synchronously to another node. So here, if this node fails, the, the first node won, then there's still data available at the second node. So this is, Portbox is sort of a middleman between the old world and the new world. In the old world where you have storage replication, if you have a failure on one side, you have the data available on the other side. 
In the new world, you replicate everything on layer 7, you have your elastic, you have your uh, uh, whatever you want, that's replicated uh, uh, for you by the storage application. So this would be, and that's how we use it, this would be very beneficial for applications that don't have replication at layer 7. Let's say you just have an application which has local storage and nothing else. But you still want it to be resilient. If it fails, you want it to be available to, uh, in another, another site, in another location, or maybe just come back and have all the storage available. In those cases, then it's, that's where, where Portworks is very, very beneficial. So you can access it from other, from other nodes in the cluster, the data. Uh, if, a, if a replica fails, it automatically re-replicates it for you, uh, etc. So it's, it makes life easier. You don't have to think about it. It just works out of the box. So at the second customer, we're using the combination of both. So layer 7 replication, those applications that, that support that, and Portbox replication for those applications that don't support, that don't have their own replication, that just want to store some files, whatever. And you make sure you have them all, always available on other sites. If a site goes down, you can always get it on, um, on another site. So back to this. Why do I have this slide here? Because now we go into the technical details. How did we implement this? So for those who not really know about Linux, I'm sorry, I just want to show you this. Uh, we, we were using LVM. So LVM is Logical Volume Manager. So we don't attach to disk, physically local disks, but we came up with another idea. We were using log logical volumes. And uh, after consulting uh, Portworks, that is uh, supported. So we can use it both for our Mesos storage and for our Portwork storage. So this is how we set up our, uh, our volumes. So here you see in the top, you see the uh, VG00. That's the, uh, that's the local disk, the SATA disk. And there you see the two, the next are the two, uh, two terabyte disks. And then the last one is an SSD. Just as depicted in this, in this image, yes? And there, the next one, what you see is how we create the volume groups. In the volume groups, we, the first one is used for the operating system, VG00, and then the next one is AZD0, that's the physical local hard drives, the rotating and spinning disks. So here we see, you see the logical volumes, um, and uh, what can I say? So uh, the most important, or the top is all, all the things for uh, operating system, some DCS stuff, Docker of course, here it's still 16 gigabytes, but we extended that to 40 uh, just uh, a few days later. So, and then you see here, this one, the one terabyte, that's the big biggie. That is where the persistent storage of DCS goes. So we use, we've now allocated one terabyte of the four terabyte spinning disks to uh, DCS, uh, Mesos storage, and we allocated uh, 250 gigs to uh, Portworx and another 100 gigs on SSD to port works. And then the last one is a journaling, not really out of scope for this talk. And this is what you see when you do an Alice block ID. Also, again, for the nerds. Um, so what do we see here? Um, so you see the uh, Farlib Docker, and then the SDB. There you see the Mesos and the port works. So, 250 gigs for Portworks and one terabyte for Mesos. So the Portworks volume is not mounted because that will be assigned directly to the Portworks volume, not using the mounts. And we also see the SSD L, uh, logical volume Portworks, again, 100 gigabytes also assigned to Portworks. And then at the bottom, you will see some of the uh, applications I created using Portworks. So there's the volumes, I installed Confluent Kafka using Portworks, which is sort of uh, not really the model we're following, but just to give it a try, and there you see it. And this is then uh, the uh, uh, Portworks status. So on the top, you see those two storage entities I created. One is the rotating disk, that's low priority, you see the low priority. And then the next one, oh, maybe I'll point with the mouse, here you see the low. And then the next one is high priority, that's of course the SSDs.
Um, and then uh, at the bottom uh, you see, uh, let me just put on my glasses, I'm sorry. Uh, you see all the, all the different nodes with, the, with their storage and how much storage there is used. Yeah, so totally is available 350 gigabytes, 100, 250 gigabytes uh, rotating this and 100 gigabytes in, in SSDs. And then the last one, a little bit too small, I'm sorry. But there you see the number of volumes we, uh, we created. So we have, uh, we have Confluent Kafka, we have uh, Zuki, Portworks, uh, Zookeeper, and we have some other, uh, some other tool, uh, NiFi, maybe someone knows NiFi, it's a big data tool. Uh, NiFi Registry, and Grafana, whatever. So, that is the way how we set up our environment. Not using physical storage drive, attaching a drive directly to the uh, to portworks, one, assigning one drive for portworks, another drive to uh, message storage. No, we just create logical volumes and then now we have allocated, I think, um, two and a half terabyte for ACDs and 100 gigabytes for SSDs. And now we can just as requested, we can add more storage. So this is the way we, we came up with using storage on our environment. So uh, what, what is uh, Mesosphere doing about it? They, they are adding now a new storage layer. So you can do the, the, the work we did with Logical Volume Manager. You can, yeah, you can do that uh, through the interface of, a, of a, storage, a storage interface. It is an enterprise feature. You have to pay for it. So either you go the way we do it currently, or you pay the big bucks, and then you get you can do it automatically. And then what we don't have currently, we, we cannot assign, or only using this very difficult method, we cannot assign SSD to our local storage, to a local uh, to, to a hard to a, to a framework. So that that's uh, the, the trade-offs we made. But in the next future, we have an enterprise version. We can, we can mix and match, and we still have lots of storage available. We have 100 uh, of terabyte of SSDs, and then we can just assign those SSDs to message storage and use them easily from, without having to reboot and assign the machine. So that, that was sort of the end of my story, just a uh, peek in the future, or actually not in the future, it's already there. That's the container uh, uh, storage interface, CSI. CSI is a... Uh, it came out of the, the uh, uh, well, well, especially in Kubernetes, that each storage vendor would have their code checked into Kubernetes. So, yeah, can you imagine how to maintain that? Uh, Kubernetes is written in Go, and then you have a storage vendor has to written it in another language, and and then you have DCS, and you have uh, maybe whatever other vendor, uh, Docker, uh, and and lots of other storage vendors, so that will become a mess for everyone to develop. So now they created this uh, CSI, they're now at point three, so point two is the version currently supported in DCS, and uh, Portworx uh, supports it, so that means that you can uh, use Portworx for both DCS and you can use it for Kubernetes, because they both support the CSI, so without any problem, you can use this storage for both of those both of those orchestrate at the same time. You just say to the to the CSI interface, give me some storage, give me some other uh, parameters, and then it will just hand it over to you. And if version uh, point three, uh, that's the upcoming version, or actually it's out now, but there will be also uh, uh, multi-site availability so you can uh, ask for a certain site so you can be more resilient. So I think that's the future because uh, I would promise you a little peek into the future and it's supported of course on, uh, on DCS. Okay, that was my uh, talk. Okay, thank you very much.